let's review where we were. So I'm going to quickly review where we were and then continue from there. Um, so we began by talking about the bracket polynomial and we reformulate it. Um, so here's the bracket polynomial. And, and of course the question was, if we think of the states of the bracket polynomial as a category, then how can we obtain topological information from the category? And the same for virtual knots as we've come to. And we reformulated the bracket polynomial in this form, um, essentially by multiplying by a to the minus the number of crossings in k, so that the coefficient of this part is one, and, and then we'll have a single coefficient for the B-type smoothing. And that coefficient is then going to be set equal to Q minus Q, so that the value of the loop is simplified to Q plus Q. And then with that in mind, you can think of the Q and the Q inverse as corresponding to labelings of the circles uh, with plus one or minus one, so that the evaluation of a single circle is Q for it labeled plus one and Q inverse for it labeled minus one. And, uh, and we will enhance the states by adding signs to the circles in the states. So the enhancement of a single loop state is plus and minus. The enhancement of two is four choices of plus and minus. And when you add them all up, of course, you get Q plus Q inverse squared, just as you expected to. Um, and so we can retrieve the, uh, the evaluation of the bracket by summing over states with plus or minus signs attached to each of the state loops. And then we get a sum of monomials. And, uh, and then for reasons that we explained uh, last time, we can um, think of minus one as corresponding to an algebra variable X and plus one as corresponding to an one. And uh, then this makes the multiplication of states natural in this form. So we will be using X and one rather than minus one and one. Um, and then the monomial formula for the bracket becomes the sum over the enhanced states of minus one to the number of uh, Bs in the state, number of B smoothings, because there was a minus Q for each one, and Q to the J of S, where J of S is equal to the number of B smoothings and lambda, where lambda is the, uh, is the number of pluses minus the number of minuses. In other words, it's the sum of the signs of the labels on the state. Uh, and then with that, we can rewrite uh, the bracket as the sum over i and j of minus one to the i q to the j, dimension c i j, where c i j is the module generated by the enhanced states uh, with i and j defined as above. So this is just counting how many enhanced states there are with a given i and a given j. But the clue here, or, or the assertion here, is that we are going to make c i j into a chain complex where I is going to be the moving part of the chain complex and J is an index of a particular chain complex. So in other words, we are going to set up a differential from CIJ to CI plus one J. Uh, and um, it won't change the J, but it will change I to I plus one, one more B smoothing. And, uh, and I will remind you in a moment how we did that. So the differential locally is going to correspond to re-smoothing an A smoothing into a B smoothing. And we're going to think of it as corresponding to an elementary bit of cobordism from, um, from this uh, smoothing to that smoothing forming a surface. A surface that isn't um, for our purposes yet, or maybe it will become so embedded in anything. It's just an abstract surface which carries the change from smoothing one way to smoothing the other.
And then, as we said, we want the differential to increase the homological grading by uh, I by one and leave the quantum grading J fixed. So you understand I'm calling I the number of B smoothings, the homological grading and J for want of a better term, the quantum grading. And then you see the, the formula for the bracket, the monomial formula for the bracket becomes a sum over j of q to the j times the sum over i of minus one to the i dimension cij, but that is an Euler characteristic of the complex c dot j. Uh, once there's a differential, uh, then the Euler characteristic of that complex, if we were working over the rationals, would be the same as the homology characteristic, the alternating sum of the dimensions of the homology groups. And so we end up with a formula for the bracket of uh, Avanar in terms of uh, all the characteristics of these different pieces of chain complex. And this is called the um, Q graded Euler characteristic or the Q Euler characteristic of the complex. So the coefficients of the Jones polynomial up to some normalization are Euler characteristics of homology. And we will see that the homology has invariance under Reitermeister moves. And so, and so um, we are getting a generalization of the Jones polynomial with homology. All this is very interesting formally. Um, and we're going through some of the details about its formality. But it also raises questions which keep nagging at one about uh, the uh, ultimate geometric interpretation of this, which is still up in the air. Um, because even if you were just talking about the Jones polynomial or the bracket, that one doesn't have a completely satisfactory geometric interpretation of what the Jones polynomial means. By satisfactory geometric interpretation, I mean, some way of explaining what it is in terms of some global topological idea for an embedding of a curve in three-dimensional space. We would like that. Um, we have that for some other invariants. For example, consider the fundamental group, which is defined globally in terms of the uh, complement of the knot uh, in terms of the, the embedding in three-dimensional space. But in the case of the Jones polynomial, we have these very beautifully defined partition functions, sums over states, but we don't have uh, a clear line to a three-dimensional definition. That is to say, we don't using at least elementary topology. We do using quantum field theory and Witten's integral uh, have a, such a three-dimensional interpretation, um, but this is more complex and also has some problems in the definition of the integrals involved. And for the Kovana homology, it's a deeper problem than that. And we could go into it at some point. But I'm reminding you what we did. So we have the boundary of the state is the sum over the uh, different uh, places where there are A's in the state local boundaries of those where the local boundaries obtained by re-smoothing uh, and finding out what happens there. And as we, uh, you may remember that we found that we would get a boundary that satisfied our requirements if we decided that when you split one loop into two, you take X to X tensor X and you take one to one tensor X plus X tensor one, which means locally loops, which have those labels in the state and that X squared should be zero in order to make sure that the J is preserved. And so you see when you re-smooth, you may go to two or you may go from two to one. And we discussed this before and we showed how this was compatible with what we wanted. Um, and uh, here I've stated what we did last time as a proposition. We found that these differentials are essentially uniquely uh, determined by the condition that J of the new state should be equal to J of the old state, um, that we can work in the ring K of X mod X squared, um, um, and, uh, and that these are the rules. 
And you might recall that uh, some of our compatibility conditions had to do with the fact that you could have homeomorphic surfaces that would give rise to the same uh, mapping in the chain complex. And then how did we get a chain complex out of these things? We, we graded it. The homological grading is zero A's, one B, two B's, three B's in this case of the trefoil knot. So we have tiers of states that have one B and we have tiers of states that have two and tiers that have three. And, and each of these get, generates a module. This generates the module uh, with an X on one of these, uh, with an X on this loop or a one on this loop. So th this generates, but the module is K of X mod X squared for a loop, call that V. Uh, and then we have V tensor V tensor V, and that generates the module at C1. Next time we could do some calculations. I'm going to be surveying gen general forms of things today. Um, and here we have a tensor product of three, and here we have a tensor product of three also, but these tensor products can have individual structure. This is V tensor V. Um, and then we're taking the direct sum with V tensor V and the direct sum of V tensor V. Here we have V plus V plus V. And here we have V tensor V tensor V. Here we have V tensor V. So the tensor product occurs internally to these and we take the direct sum of the modules. I might've misspoken myself a moment ago, but we're taking direct sum. Okay, and that direct sum works fine. So if you're up here in this module and you have these individual maps, which in this case are multiplication maps, then you multiply to get in here, you multiply to get in there, and you multiply to get in there, and you take the sum of those three in the direct sum. Direct sum is actually not hard to think about also categorically. And I will be talking about that in a moment. That is to say, if you imagined that you were allowed to add your maps in the category and that you could form formally direct sums of these things, why then you could start with this category and form a new category where there was a single object here, this one, there was the direct sum of these three objects, this one, and there was the mapping into the direct sum from here to here, but we're just like we did, but in algebra, taking the old and taking the appropriately signed sum of these maps. And then here we have this direct sum corresponds to an object in here. So then we have this rather straight line category like this object morphism, object, morphism, object, morphism. And it has the property that the composition of two morphisms is zero additive category. So we have a, a, an exact analog of a chain complex at the categorical level. And we can think categorically about it. And this is useful for understanding what's going on because the mappings here can also be thought of in a geometrical way as little cobordisms that move from here to here. For example, this map is obtained by doing a little cobordism that changes this uh, smoothing to that smoothing. So you go through a saddle surface to get from here to here and so on. Um, and, and as a result, you, there is a place or point of view of looking at this situation, which is entirely geometrical but assembled in a categorical kind of way we're thinking of each of these collections of circles and little cobordisms that go between them and if we have a longer composition of maps like this one well that's also described by a cobordism first you um first you did um a little saddle from here to here and then to get from here to here you did a saddle from here to here, and then to get from here to here, you did a saddle from there to there. And so you can trace how that becomes, a, how, sorry, how, how, the, how, going, how this composition becomes a certain cobordism that starts with these two circles and ends with three circles down here. And all those stories, those are all told at a level, uh, at the categorical level, um, without having to think about the algebra. And it's useful to go up to that level in order to look for the maps that might be the right ones to choose for algebraic purposes.
Um, now I remind you that the signs in the boundary for an element in the cube category follow the rule minus one to number where number is the number of A's preceding that A to be smooth. This puts the signs into the complex and makes it over the integers. So for example, if you're going from an AAA and you're taking a boundary, then you use a plus sign along the map that smooths this one, a minus sign on this one and a plus sign on that one because you're counting the preceding number of A's. If there were some Bs there, you start counting how many A's nonetheless. So when you take the boundary of this, you smooth this one with a plus and that one with a minus. And you can check that formally boundary, boundary will be equal to zero if you are working with modules over a cube category uh, by this rule. So that means that cube categories will always give you homologies as long as you had some modules at the nodes in the cube category and all these maps, these squares were commuting. Then you'll get a homology for the cube category with coefficients in the assignment of modules. And that's also just general nonsense at the category level that there is a homology theory under those circumstances. But of course it won't necessarily be topological but you can play around with it. For example, people have played around with this idea and said, oh, well then why don't we try defining some Kovanov homology analogs for graphs and so on? And indeed you can, or why not compare it with certain other kinds of homological constructions like cyclic homology for uh, Lie algebras and this kind of thing is being done. So. Uh, so by going to the categorical level, one has the possibility of playing around with a lot of different relationships. But it's still an interesting question to ask, what is all this displaying of maps among the states and categorifying in this way have to do with the spatial quality uh, that we're trying to understand about the knot itself? What does it have to do with the with the usual way of thinking about the topology of a knot. It's not obvious. So let's continue our review. Uh, we have the boundary mapping, which goes from I to I plus one and leaves J alone. And remember, for J to remain fixed, we needed that the lambda, the sum of the signs, has to go down by one. And um, and that determined the boundary, and then we found out what it was. Oh, uh, this slide is slightly out of order, but probably worth dwelling on for a moment. And I will come back to it if I do when I do some more detailed calculation. This is just looking at how the Q bracket behaves under Reitermeister moves. And you see that under a plot positive first Reitermeister move, it multiplies by Q inverse. But under a negative first Reitermeister move, it multiplies by minus q squared. And under, um, under an ordinary two move, it multiplies by minus q, and it's invariant under the third Reitermeister move. And I see that I miss, I did not write something that I would like to write, and I may have said it before, that this means that you can normalize the bracket by multiplying by something. And in order to remind you what it is that you have to multiply by, I'm going to have to open up the Blackboard. Let me do that. So what uh, the, the point that I'm reminding you about is that if I have set up this bracket, with the value of the loop equal to Q plus Q inverse, 
uh, then we can define JK to be equal to Q to the number of plus minus twice the number of minus bracket K and I need to sign, my, I'm sorry. And then this will be invariant under all three Rademeister moves. And um, let's compare with the slideshow for a second to see what this is saying. You see, if you look at the first Reitermeister move, it multiplies by Q inverse, but this was a positive one. So you need to multiply by Q to the number of plus, and that's what I'm doing. In this one, you have minus Q squared, so you need to multiply by Q to the minus two for the number of minus, and this is one minus, and a minus sign for that. So this was providing the compensations that will make it invariant under the first Reitermeister move. As for the second, you can check that that also works out and so on. So, um, so this, is the, um, this is the normalization. And here's an exercise for you. Find out. the formula that translates JK to JK of Q to VK of T, Jones, where the standard definition of Jones is by the skein relation, T inverse V plus minus T V minus equals root T minus one over root T V smooth. And V is normalized to be equal to one on the unknot. and invariant under all three Reitermeister moves, okay? So the exercise is, I leave it to you to figure out the whole thing, okay? There's some translation. Uh, what is it exactly? Uh, not right, there should be a formula that re-expresses the Jones polynomial in terms of J or vice versa. And I leave it to you to puzzle that one out and figure out what the formula should be, okay? So um, getting back to our, our continuance here, this is, this is how we found the algebra. Remember, plus and plus should go to plus because it has to go down by one. Plus and minus goes down by one. Minus and minus is in trouble, so we call it zero. And x going to x, x will make it go down by one because x is a minus one. And uh, one going to one x and x one will make it go down to zero from one. Uh, again, and so we get the algebra out from by this interesting heuristic of making the J constant. And then we did lots of checking like this. I will be putting this slideshow into the um, into the record, so you can use the slideshow for a little review. But you can do lots of exercises more than I did uh, to check out various uh, the various cases of compatibility that are, need to be done. And then we talked about the algebra structure a little more carefully. We talked about uh, the co-unit and the unit, and we did the calculation here that tells us that if we went through a one here, um, then we would get epsilon of one times X plus epsilon of X times one should be equal to one because 
this go at one here goes to one x tensor one plus one tensor x and then you multiply by the epsilon and that Im implies that epsilon of x should be equal to one and epsilon of one should be equal to zero and now now i'm going a little farther because i think that's about where we ended up among other things this lets us figure out what some closed surfaces are if you went for the closed surface you start in the ring and you go by the unit into the surface so you went epsilon of the unit one epsilon of the unit is zero right um so uh, so the value of a little sphere is zero in this cobordism theory. On the other hand, if we do a torus, we start with a one, we get a one, then we co-multiply and we get one tensor x plus x tensor one, and then we multiply and we get two x, one times x plus one times x. And then we apply epsilon, but epsilon of x is equal to zero. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, excuse me, I'm misspeaking myself entirely. Epsilon of x is one, so epsilon of two x is two, and the value of the torus is two. So we get a non, this is here in this little cobordism theory, we're getting a non-trivial value for a torus, but we get a trivial value for a sphere. Ah, and I didn't go farther, so now we have to go off to, off to, um, to the world of, uh, of, of the blackboard and do a little more. What about a double torus? What's going to happen with that? So at this stage, I have a one coming from the co-unit. And then here, I have one tensor X plus X tensor one. And then I multiply, get to that equatorial point and add and I get two X. And then I co-multiply and I get 2x tensor x. And then I multiply and I get zero. So I get zero. So you see that all uh, surfaces of genus G with the genus greater than one have value zero. Now, the point of this is that we're beginning to understand something about the structure of the evaluations of these cobordisms, and that's going to help us understand the structure of the chain complex, because after all, they, these underlie the structure of the chain complex. So let's keep on looking. We have that this is two. Um, and I want to make a side remark about categorification. Uh, I think this one will help, but I think I'll make it later or I'll come back to this at another point. But I do want to stay in the category level. You'll see what I'm about to do. So we have the category whose objects are the states and the morphisms are the arrows. And... Um, and uh, we're using the cobordisms to interpret the morphisms. And, um, and then if you look at uh, one of the uh, situations, you see how this is working, right? You have a little cube category here. Here is, um, here is um, uh, the hop link. Uh, when I say the hop link, there it is. Here's the hop link, a little bit small, but you see those are A smoothings going straight up. So the Covano complex for the hop link consists of these two, right? And then we smooth one or we smooth the other or we smooth them both. 
And here is a nice exercise. We will solve this exercise for you next time. Compute the Kovana homology of the half link in detail, right? Uh, it can't be too hard. Take a, take, a, take a few minutes. Got to write down the tensor product of V and V, and then look at the mapping into V and into V and back into V tensor V. Direct sum here, work it out, see what you get. Check that the Euler character, graded Euler characteristic gives you the right result for the bracket of the half link. All a very good exercise, worth your while, and I will solve it at the beginning of next time. Um, and furthermore, you can keep thinking about what happened here. What you're looking at is a functor from the cube category, which is just an abstract structure, over to this category where the objects are all this detailed loops and everything. Or, or you can think of it as a mapping into, um, into the module category uh, corresponding to this. So there's three categories in mind uh, directly here. There are the case where we have algebraic modules. Um, and then we have a functor from cube category to a module category. Or we can think of going to the Kovano category, which is purely diagrammatic and has all this extra structure in the objects and cobordisms for its arrows. And that's a nice one. That's like a, a higher dimensional diagram one, which doesn't have algebra in it yet. It just has the algebra of the category, the categorical morphisms and how they compose with one another. And then you have the fact that um, that certain things commute. I'm, I'm just re-emphasizing things we've said before. Consider what I've called boundary two and boundary one or boundary one and boundary two, which just mean um, uh, do the second factor smoothing or do the first factor smoothing. Um, and uh, first factor or second factor smoothing can happen in, in the order first to second and then do first or first to first and then do second. But that's exactly what we considered before. If first you do first and second you do second, you get this surface. If first you do second and then you do first, you get this surface, but they're homeomorphic surfaces. That's the beautiful thing about the smoothing method of defining the morphisms, when you go over to the Kovanov category with cobordisms, then all the squares commute. So if you think of the cube category in the abstract as having its squares commute, then you automatically get a functor to the Kovanov category because commuting still happens over here. And then we can think of going to the module category if we want to, or we can think of trying to understand what's going on right in this category as it is in front of us. And that is the part that I want to spend a little time on now. Drawer calls it a canopoly, the category making this category into something that looks like a chain complex. And we already know how to do it. That's the beautiful thing. And of course, you should do the exercise of computing with this chain complex by hand to really feel it as a chain complex. But that's a good thing for you to do. And then we'll go over it next time. But here we have this. Oh, and um, when we get to virtuals, you'll have to do an exercise with virtuals. So um, let me recommend one because you can always do it mod two, as we'll remark very soon. But what, what examples are good for, uh, for working if you're going to do some examples by hand? Well, there's the hop link. Of course, everybody can do the hop link. And, and, and if you're working in the simplest arena of the virtuals, which we'll come to in a moment, then everyone can do this virtual knot because it's no worse than the hop link. It's only got two crossings. You can set up the modules for that without any trouble. So, so those are the two simplest examples that you can work. The next one, of course, is the truffle knot. And if you were to do ordinary Kovana homology for the truffle knot, you'll have to work a bit. You've got eight states and a lot of maps. So I will come prepared next time with, um, with uh, um, um, an exposition of homology of the truffle knot also. 
and you can take it as homework or not to do that one that's that that would take more time for you or you can look it up but uh, because you'll find it done in some papers on the subject but these two you can sit down with a little pad of paper and do this and it's worth your while and what should you do next if you're doing things by hand well maybe the next simplest knot is not a bad idea next simplest knot is the figure eight knot. Mm -hmm. um, but, but after that, it starts getting complicated. Uh, and another thing that I will um, discuss is drawer barnaton. Program. To compute. Cobanophomology. Um, now, I, I, I will discuss it in the sense that I will show you how to operate it and what the strategy, what some of the strategy is for writing such a program. This is for classical. I'm going to very soon be talking about the problem of how do we define covanophomology for virtuals over the integers. And that leads to a definition which is rather hard to program. And we're still fighting with a good way to write a program for that. But if it's classical, then you can do this. So, so you see what I'm recommending. I'm recommending at the very least these two for exercise, the truffle knot and a little more and see what else you can do. Okay. Um, so that's the situation. Now let's go back here. So consider this a little bit. We're going to make an abstract analog of a chain complex from the Kovanov category by extending it to an additive category with direct sums. I'm writing the formalism of this a little bit, so you see what I mean by that. Um, suppose that you had a is a direct sum of a bunch of things, and B is a direct sum of a bunch of things. And suppose you had a bunch of maps, as we do, Fij's from Ai's to Bj's. It's our situation if we were to index it. So we have a matrix of maps, right? Um, and the way we're going to talk about a composition is that we have to think about going from Ai to Bk and then from BK to CJ by any map that happens to go from BK to CJ, you see? So if there is a map from AI to BK and there is also a map from BK to CJ, then there has to be a composition map, FIK, BGKJ from AI to CJ. So that means that the composition of F and G is the same as matrix multiplication. We're going to take the, the sum of all the mappings like that. And that is exactly what we have been doing when we were thinking of a differential. So for example, the differential here is the sum of these two maps. I'm not worrying about signs. And the differential here is the sum of these two maps. So that means that the combined differential consists of this composition and this one. Right, because those are all the possible compositions that are available. But go back to go back to a more complex situation like uh, this one, and uh, let's consider this differential, which which involves all three of these, and this differential, which involves all of the maps out from these. And if you combine these two differentials, then you're going to be getting all of the different possibilities. This path this path, this path, this path, all of them. You're going to be getting the sum of all of them, all the different ways of getting from here to here, all the different pathways that there are available to you. Um, and and uh, add it up with signs, of course, and that's the combined differential. So we can say all that without knowing much algebra. We're just saying it in the external world of categories and maps. That's my point, that you can think that way. And it's structurally helpful to think that way. And then 
uh, the chain complex is the sum over the objects uh, uh, with a given B. That's the I part of the chain complex. And the boundary map is the sum plus or minus of all those local boundary maps like that. Okay, we agree. That's what we said before. But then I want now I want to go a little farther and I want to remind you that two maps of chain complexes are said to be homotopic, chain homotopic, if there exists an H, which takes you backward in the uh, to one higher dimension in the usual situation and one lower index in our situation, such that boundary H plus H boundary is equal to the difference. What's this about? Let's remind ourselves of what this is about. Why do I want to talk about chain homotopy? Because of course, if you want to see that something is invariant in homology, if you show that two things are chain homotopic, then they will give you the same things in homology. But what, what is going on here? Suppose we have a space X spaces, and you have a couple of maps from X to Y. Hmm? Then we say that uh, these maps are homotopic if there is a mapping from X cross the unit interval into Y. We say F is homotopic to G if there exists F taking X cross Y in there such that F of X zero is F and F of X one is G, right? And if you drew a picture for yourself about what that would look like, it looks like this, that the top of the thing, you would have F. And at the bottom of the thing, you would have, there's the F. And at the, at the top of F, you would have F. At the bottom of F, you would have G. Um, and, um, and that's the way things look like that, right? So, so then if you think of this formally, you see that, um, that that means that over in Y, there is going to be over over in the space y you're going to find structures that look like this where you're going to have f of x up at the top and you're going to have g of x down at the bottom or vice versa and and uh and along here you're going to have the restriction to the boundary if x were if x had if x if x was something that had boundary so so if you called this guy h over here then you would see that the boundary of H is uh, uh, the, that, yeah, that the boundary of uh, of this thing here um, is looking like F minus G, but um, also H applied to the boundary of x. So the boundary, you could say here is h of x, right? And we have that the boundary of h of x is f of x minus g of x plus, but I will, I'll just write plus, I'm not worrying about signs, plus h on the boundary of x. So that's, that's what the what the formal image of a homotopy looks like. It looks like you have um, an H, which is, which is the image of the homotopy between F and G, and it trails along, if you were looking at, uh, at a cell, and you, uh, a little cell X, and you watched how it, how it homotopped to another cell over here, and this was the F, and this was the G, then along the boundary of the cell, you would be getting the homotopy on the boundary of the cell. So you get that the boundary of the homotopy applied to the X is equal to the difference or, or sum of F and G and H applied to the boundary. So that is the, that is the pattern of what a homotopy looks like. 
and can be rewritten in terms of the way chains behave in a cell complex. So with that in mind, um, we're reminding you that we will say that two, and I won't worry about signs here. So then the boundary H plus H boundary would be F minus G. But what, what is H looking like? You see, at the level of cell complex, at chain complex, I want to say it a little more. So we, the, in the usual notation, we have n chains on x on a space go to n minus one chains on the space, right? Under a boundary map. And the, when we, if you think of this little guy here as belonging to the n chains on x, then the h that I was talking about, which looks like fx on this end and gx on this end, this guy, this guy is higher dimensional. So, um, so if, if X were, and we have a higher dimensional piece here. So the H takes you from lower dimension to higher dimension like that. So when we say there is an H, we're saying that boundary H plus H boundary is equal to F minus G. F and G are, are maps that are, that, are, are, that are defined on this chain complex here to somebody else. But there has to be a mapping here, and, uh, or, or let's just say that there are mappings from, from this to itself, all right? I won't worry about another one. Um, but the point is, that the H takes you up a dimension. And then when you apply the boundary, you end up back here. And if you do, if you do uh, boundary and then you do H, you still end up back in here. So ever all the everything is happening in there. And um, and that's the chain homotopy. So if you have a mapping from one chain complex to another then you need mappings that behave this way, that take you up one dimension. Now this will all become more concrete in a moment in the abstract sense. But the point is that um, what I want to show is that in order to obtain variance is that certain things are chain homotopic. So what we're going to look at now is the second Reitermeister move and what the Kovanov complex looks like in relation to the second Reitermeister move. So hold on to your hat here and just look at this. Here is the second Reitermeister move. And, and here is the locally all the different bits and pieces of the chain complex for the second Reitermeister move. A smoothing, A smoothing. Boundary one meaning re-smooth on the left one, and boundary two meaning re-smooth on the right one. So when I re-smooth, I get A, B, and B, A, and a loop in the big case, and then I get B, two Bs. And that's how it looks locally. Now, what is the relationship between that and the category Kovanov category and its corresponding canopoly. Remember, the canopoly is the thing that looks like a chain complex, but we're only looking at it from category eyes, but it is the chain complex. So, what is the category and what does the canopoly look like after the raster move? Well, so all this, all this funny uh, 
expansion here just simplified away, right? You just have this parallel lines, but those parallel lines look like the AB smoothing in the middle of this little complex here. So if you line up this category with that category, then you can compare all the rest of it um, between here and here. But now you begin to see what the problem is to live just at the level of the category. Because if I wanted to map the category to the category, the objects change their shape in a funny way. And furthermore, I would like to take this object to two objects. And I don't have that capacity in the pure category of the world. But if I take the direct sum canopoly category, or if I take the modules that we've already constructed, then I can map between this one and that one. And uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to define a mapping which takes me up to this one and a mapping which takes me down to this one. It's going to be the identity. I'm just talking about how it looks locally here and you can fill in the rest for your own amusement, but this is going to go by the identity because they have the same structure. But here, what are we going to do for the lower one? Well, when you go away from the one with the loop, you can let the loop die by a cobordism. Dying by a cobordism is applying the co-unit. So the co-unit applied to the tensor product in here at this point will take you from here to here or I could let the loop be born, and that means apply the unit and go up. You can use the language unit, co-unit if you want to, or you can just say in the cobordism language, allow a loop to be born or die. And that language is useful to use. So we now have, um, and uh, I've indicated the other one here, these are the identity mappings. So now I have a, a map from the canopoly of the of W to the canopoly of Z. And I want to show that the composition of, of these mappings, one and two, if I start here and go back to here, or if I start here and go down here and come back, I want to show that those are chain homotopic to the identity in which case I will have shown that the two complexes have the same homology. It is worth your while if you haven't thought about the algebra of how homology and chain homotopy are related to play with it a little bit at the complex level um, separately. For example, um, um, notice, where's my, there it is. Notice that um, uh, if you apply F minus G to somebody whose boundary is zero, and it satisfies this formula, then let's suppose you applied F minus G to somebody whose boundary is zero, call it X. Then you get F, minus, F of X minus G of X is equal to H boundary X, but that's zero boundary h of x. So you see, if f of if if you apply f minus g to somebody whose boundary is zero, you get somebody that is a boundary. And that means that f of x and g of x mean the same thing in homology. They're equal in homology. They're homologous. So that's part and parcel of the fact that chain homotopy captures the essence of what it means to be uh, uh, what it means for maps to induce the same thing in homology. But I digress. So here we are, and we're looking at this as carefully as we can. We want to compare this with this. So first of all, let's look at the one where we end up here. So we start here at the top and we go, I'm sorry, we start here and we go up identity and back identity. That's the identity map. What about this one? Um, we go, we create, um, we go this way and create a loop, and then we come back and create and let the loop die. 
that is F1 G1. And that meant that when doing F1, you created a loop and in doing G1, you allowed it to die. But in the very middle of that, you created a sphere and the value of a sphere is zero, remember? So this map is zero. The, comp the composition at the bottom part is zero and the composition from top to bottom is identity. So when you compose and compare with what happened at this way, you have a map from Z to W and a map from W to Z. And if you start in W and come back to W, you end up on the identity on W, no problem. So we have to consider it the other way. Start in Z, go to W and come back. Uh, well, in that case, it's the identity up in this portion and it's this part that I have to think about. The lower portion, I do G1, I come back by F1. And, I, and that gives me a mapping from here to here. And that's the one that I want to see has the right structure. So it's the lower portion of this along which I want to see the chain homotopy occur. And that's why I have drawn an H here and an H here, which are going into the higher dimension, the not, not, not indexed by a higher dimension, but that's the way it goes backward from the direction of the boundary. And what could these maps be? Well, you look for the simplest possible map, and then it turns out that it's the right one. The simplest possible map that would go from here to here is to create a loop. And the simplest possible map that would go from here to here is to allow a loop to die. So those are my maps H1 and H2. So now we have the following. We have F1 and G1, though we already discussed them, and they give birth to a loop or they let a loop die and they go through what they go through. But then I don't have to worry about the next part. I won't tell you about it. But we also have the uh, boundary mappings. And I think everything is on the slide for you to see uh, because I'm only concerned with the lower line, remember? And, um, and the H, the F, the F starts here, I've drawn it down, but it starts here and it gives rise to a loop. The G starts here with a loop and lets a loop die. The boundary one starts here and re-smooths at A to give birth to a circle. The boundary two starts in the middle here and amalgamates a circle, multiplies. And that's what you see here over on the right. The H1 um, starts here with a circle in the middle and lets it die. And the H2 starts with no circle and gives birth to a circle. So there they are. Um, those are the mappings involved. And we want to put them together in the form of the homotopy. So I have on the one hand, the composition G1, F1. I have the identity, which is just a tube going from here to here. And then I have the H1 boundary one <coughs> and the boundary two H2. And we want that this mapping, F1, G1, plus the identity, remember, I'm not worrying about signs, should be equal to H1, boundary one, plus boundary two, H2. So that's this equation here. That equation is supposed to be true. Now, you could try evaluating the algebra on it, like we evaluated the algebra on cobordisms for many hours yesterday, right? I mean, last week and this week, but you could also just think about it. Um, and you would find if you went to the algebra that it was true. 
But what Dror noticed about this is really brilliant. He said, I want to think about it as a cobordism. What kind of an equation about cobordisms is this? And so let's strip off all the labels and just look at it as an equation about cobordism. So I just took off the labels. That's all the same thing. Here it is, just the labels. And then you see that uh, I can think of it in the following way. I have one, two, three, four bits of surface near one another. I happen to have drawn one as a little cup and another as a little cap and another as a bit of surface, like a half cylinder in the other, but it's just four bits of surface near one another. And then in this one, one and two are tubed together. In this one, three and four are tubed together. In this one, one and four are tubed together. And in this one, three and two are tubed together. One tube has been added in each case. I've tubed one and two, two and three, three and four, and one and four. One, two, three, four. One and two, two and three, three and four, four and one. Very simple pattern. And add it up. And then it turns out if you put the signs back in, you want it to alternate. One, two, minus two, three, plus three, four, minus one, four. When I was talking about this at the end of the previous course, I talked about this a little more. And I'll come back to that, but I'm not going to do that now. Um, I'm just going to stay with this as, a, as an amazing identity. Because you see, what is your understanding when he looks at Is there a question? What is your understanding when he looks at this? He's understanding, as you can understand, that if you went back here and ran the algebra on it, you would find it was an algebra identity. But that's a rather complicated bunch of verifications to do. On the other hand, he's understanding that it's a certain kind of cobordism identity. And we could take it as axiomatic instead of having the algebra. If we took it as axiomatic, then we would say, I will assume that this 4-2 by relation is given. And that the value of a sphere is equal to zero. You need that. And then you would be taking all possible cobordisms that you could have in the category, modulo this relation, and that a sphere is zero. And then you would have that at the level of the canopoly, the categorical chain complex, the homology, not, not the homology, but the chain homotopy invariance would be satisfied for the two move. And then we'll come back to that and talk about how you verify three move and so on. But let's just stay with the two move as, as our exemplar today. So that means that at the categorical level, of just the states thought of as a, at a category with the morphisms as cobordisms, and you mod out by the four tube relation, you're getting something which is an invariant of knots and links because it's chain homotopy invariant. And the chain homotopy class of the canopoly is what well, is the abstract categorical version of the Kovana homology. So it takes a leap of abstraction to get up there, right? I don't know how to explain that in a simple way without going through a little bit of the algebra to motivate thinking about the cobordisms and so on. That might just be my reluctance. Maybe you ought to try it out. Um, find a friend who's willing to listen to you and try telling it to them without any algebra at all, just cobordisms and category arrows. But that's where that, but that it's at that level that you can see what it is that's involved at the categorical way of thinking about it to have this invariant, uh, the Kovana homology invariant. You don't really need the chain complex. You only need this fake categorical chain complex and it's chain homotopy type to have expressed what the invariance is. So that's the drawer theory. Now let's continue with the drawer theory and come back down into algebra.
Here's the four tube relation. One, two, three, four, okay? One and two, three and four, one and four, three and two. Well, in that form, all right? Um, and we can try, it doesn't matter how you do it. You can label them any way you want. And then you just go through the list. One, two, two, three, three, four, one, four. Um, the, the thing that I talked about before is that this has the look of a certain kind of boundary relation or cycle relation. And one should think about that and we'll come back to it. But let's look at what are the consequences of the four tube relation. That's how we're going to get back down to the ground in the algebra. So here's a, here's a situation. Uh, the, the little line means a surface. I'm just abbreviating a surface into a little line. So I have a patch of surface here and an adjacent patch here, four and three. So I can do one, two, I can do two, three. I can do one, two, and I can do four, three. So I can do one, two, minus two, three. Hmm. I may have my signs a little bit wrong. Uh, let's see. I'm not going to worry you about my signs. I take this to be the four tube relation. All right. Um, and then with that, you see, I'm getting that uh, twice this is equal to this plus this. So this one is just a tube from top to bottom. And this one is a little torus added to that. And I'm dividing by two. And this is a little torus added to that. So we can write tube equals torus at the top and torus at the bottom. And the tube gets broken into a, into a cup and a cap in both cases. Now, remember what a torus would actually do if you had it around. It would produce um, a 2x, which this divided by 2 becomes an x. So, uh, so we can think of this as corresponding to the element x. It's the abstract correspondent of the element x, and I will label with a dot. And I will understand that it could be an algebra element X, but I don't know what algebra I'm in anymore. All right. So then we have the tube relation. So the four tube relation implies the tube relation, a dot here representing a certain algebra element X. And that tells you that the cobordisms are all going to be oversimplified in some sense into, an al into algebra, because whenever you have a tube, it will break up. And then you can see that the tube relation actually implies the four tube relation. I'm actually illustrating it here. And I think I got the order right. One, two, three, four. So this is one, two, minus two, three, plus three, four, minus one four, right? Putting in the tubes. Now we're going to take each of these tubes and expand it by the tube relation. So it becomes dot upper and dot lower. And I've done it horizontally, yes. Um, no, excuse me. Yes, it's a little hard to look at that. This is one object and this is another one down here. This is the breaking up of this tube into dot left and dot right, okay? This vertical tube, dot upper, dot lower. This horizontal tube, dot um, to the right, dot to the left. And this vertical tube, dot up and dot down. And the signs, um, plus and plus, minus and minus, because of that minus, plus and plus, and minus and minus. And now you look at all of this, it would be nice with a little more parentheses, but here's this fourfold with a dot in the upper right, left-hand corner. 
and here it is appearing with a minus sign and so on down the line they all cancel out so the tube relation is the same as the four tube relation but the tube relation is easier to understand algebraically so now we're going into the algebra um you can also get the co-product by the tube relation as long as i have it in my slideshow let's look at it we want to know what happens when we go this way but by the tube relation i can break this tube into a dot here and nothing there or nothing there and dot here and then i can break this one and that'll have a double dot and a dot 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 and a dot like that so you see I can I have now written this out and I could translate it into algebra using epsilon and using the coproduct and the product. We'll do it. But let's go just look at the tube relation for a moment. Here's the tube relation and I want to write out what it would be in algebra. So I'm letting dot be x in some algebra that's unknown to me at the moment. And then if you put an alpha through this tube, it goes out, it goes down identically. But if you put an alpha through this tube, alpha becomes multiplied by x, and, and then you have the coproduct applied. So that's alpha, epsilon alpha x, and this is just one. Or you have alpha in here, and you have epsilon of alpha, and then here's the x. So you see the, the tube relation is the relation alpha equals epsilon of alpha x times one plus epsilon of alpha times x. And now remember, we are behaving as though we never saw the algebra before, but whatever algebra it is, it would have a co-unit and a unit, and we would understand this notion of letting the algebra be evaluated by flowing down through morphisms, that we're assuming. So let x be alpha, and then we have, x equals epsilon of x squared times 1 plus epsilon of x times x. And let 1 be alpha, and then you get 1 equals epsilon of x times 1 plus epsilon of 1 times x. Now, x equals epsilon of x squared times 1 plus epsilon of x times x. We need epsilon of x equals 1. We need epsilon of x squared equals 0. And from this one, we need epsilon of x equals 1, and that's compatible. And we need epsilon of 1 is equal to 0. But epsilon of x squared equals 0. That's interesting. So let's try x squared. If we put in x squared, we get x cubed here. And then we have x squared here. And we know that epsilon of x squared is 0. So that says that x squared is a multiple of 1. x squared is some constant. We had x squared equals 0 in our original theory, but we're finding out that we could use algebra, the algebra that will be a Frobenius algebra that will be a cobordism invariant algebra. It could have x squared equal to a constant. And then as far as the coproduct is concerned, I leave you to look at this yourself. Um, you will find that uh, the coproduct of one is x tensor one plus one tensor x. And the coproduct of x is some multiple of one tensor one plus x tensor x. And, uh, and so you will find that you have a more general algebra. Your more general algebra looks like this x squared is a constant. Epsilon of x is 1. Epsilon of 1 is 0. Delta of 1 is 1 tensor x plus x tensor 1. Delta of x is a constant times 1 tensor 1 plus x tensor x. And this is a Frobenius algebra. It has all the invariance properties you would want. We have shown you in this way of thinking how to discover it by starting with the four tube relation, reducing it to the tube relation, and then using the tube relation to deduce the algebra. And 
If you use this algebra instead of the original Kovanov algebra, you will have a Kovanov homology. And in fact, you get more than the original Kovanov homology. At k equals zero, you have the original Kovanov homology. And then in the history of things, at k equals one, you get Yun Sun Li's Kovanov homology at k equals one, x squared equals one. And that gives you another Kovanov homology. And then the story historically, and you can look at the papers on the archive, maybe I should put them into the Dropbox, I will. Paper by Yun Sun Li and papers by Rasmussen. <coughs> Rasmussen saw that you could compare Li and Kovanov and that there was a spectral sequence relating them. And that by examining Lee and Kovanov together, you could get very subtle invariants of knots and links, uh, which are called Rasmussen invariant. So, so this is this, this is a categorical algebraic story leading to this general Kovanov, general um, Frobenius algebra that gives you link homology. It isn't the only thing that will give you link homology either. Um, you can. I should get, get the references straight for you and put them in the Dropbox. But Lee's algebra is this one. And the thing about Lee's algebra is if you use it, uh, the J will not be preserved. Of course not, because we figured out that the J is only preserved if you use the Kovano setup. But the J is not preserved and there is a grading difference. If you take the boundary of something, the J of that will be greater than or equal to the J, the usual J. So, um, so that means that you can filter the complex in relation to that and watch what happens to Lee homology in that filtration. And that is what gives rise to these relationships between Kovanov homology and Lee homology and the Rasmussen invariant. I, I don't want to start discussing technicalities about that, but this is fun and it gives you an exercise to do. Here's Lee's algebra. And if you let R be one plus X over two and G be one minus X over two, and you'll see that epsilon of R is a half and epsilon of G is minus a half and R plus G is one and R squared is R and G squared is G and RG is zero. And delta of R is two R tensor R and delta of G is minus two G tensor G. And so that's an easier, uh, basis to play around with for thinking about Lee's algebra. And then if you think about it that way, then you can produce by labeling, essentially by coloring cycles in the states, you can produce elements that have boundary zero. For example, this element, because RG is zero uh, and because GR is zero, and these are all multiplying, the boundary of this is zero. So here's a cycle, cycles obtained by coloring. And we'll come back to that. Um, cycles obtained by coloring turn out in using cipher circle cir smoothings to generate the Lee homology. The Lee homology is simpler to understand, but the relationship, its subtle relationship to Kovanov homology gives rise to very beautiful Rasmussen invariant. So let me stop at this point on this point and talk to you a little bit about what goes on in understanding what happens with virtuals. So I'm going to draw an example that shows you the difficulty that one confronts in dealing with virtuals. And this is a, a, a very trivial piece of, of, of knot theory. It's a trivial virtual knot, but it's going to give us something interesting to look at for a Kovanov complex. So I'm looking at the Kovanov complex of this trivial knot. So this is an A smoothing, and this is an A smoothing. So the A smoothing is like this.
and let's um, let's draw the complex. So I'm going to go draw it as a square. I'm going to re-smooth here. And then I'm going to re-smooth here. Or I can smooth here. That's a co-multiplication. And then I can multiply up here. Okay. Now, what about this? Well, you just saw uh, a key problem. Here's our key problem. We we might have a re-smoothing of this kind, where you go from here to here. But it's one loop, one loop, one loop. So you see, um, the the extra the extra thing that happens in virtuals is that you can have single loop, single loop to single loop, um, resmoothing maps. Doesn't happen in classical knots and links. In classical knots and links, you either go from two to one or from one to two. So we are going to take. So then the question is, how do you deal with that? And what we will do is we will take a to equal to zero. Now, later I may discuss other options where we don't take a to equal to zero, but let's suppose that we do take a to equal to zero. Then as you go around this side of the square, you get zero. And what happens when you go around this side of the square? Because you want at least mod two commuting squares, don't you? And over the integers, you'd like the square stand like commute after you've put in all the signs. So we can try it out. Suppose I had a one here. Then I have here two loops, one tensor X plus X tensor one. And then I multiply and add, and I get two X. Oh. So this won't commute, but it's okay mod two. So the moral of this story is that mod two Covano homology is okay for virtuals. So you can go ahead and do those exercises that I was just suggesting to you and work out the mod to Covano homology of some simple, small virtual things. Um, like the simplest virtual thing, you might, I was talking about simple exercises. There is nothing simpler than this one, right? You could do that one. One crossing link and compare with what happens to the unlink, right? Of course, that ought to be interesting. Um, or you can do uh, the, the virtual trefoil and so on. So you can do a few examples, worth your while, check the gradings and everything. But what are we going to do to make it work over the integers? Well, Monturov, Vasily Monturov, found a very interesting answer to this, and that's the one that I'm going to concentrate on for a while. And then after we've talked about that for a while, we'll talk about the doubled Kovana homology of Will Rushworth, um, which is a different kind of solution to integer Kovana homology. And then maybe other variations will come uh, up, but... Um, 
but the Vasily solution is motivated by a kind of parity idea that is related to the virtual crossings appearing. You might think of it that way. Um, the idea is that the X's are going to be a local coefficient system instead of just anywhere on the loop. And that when you move the X around, you watch to see whether it goes through a virtual crossing or not. That's level one of thinking about this. And you will find if we do this, I'm, I guess I'm not going to do it because we're out of time, but you'll find that when you do it, one of the X's gets switched in sign due to this local coefficient system, and this ends up going to zero. That's the kind of solution that he does. So I'll just write Vasily Monturov integer co via local coefficient system. And that's where we start next time, uh, along with the various exercise solutions that are, are, are good for grounding, right? Uh, we want to do them. And then we will start talking about how Vasily's local coefficient system method for defining integral Kovana homology for virtuals works. And what you can deduce from that, because we managed to deduce some nice things from that without having to compute it. Computing it turns out to be a nice challenge, and it would be good to have computer programs that could show us what's going on here. So that's it for today. I'll stop. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when uh, k is zero, uh, you get a Kavano homology. When k is one, you get a Lee homology. So how about the k takes others, uh, takes other values? Um, I haven't thought about it as carefully as I should, but I think that probably you won't get much more information. The real difference is between k not zero and k zero. So, but um, of course, I could be wrong. Maybe there, maybe there is something about taking it. Of course, you could take it as a whole, right? Um, uh, but but the interesting information came in comparing the grading when k was not zero with the grading when k was zero. So I think that everything seems to be happening by just letting k be one. But uh, don't quote me on that. It could be, it could okay. be that uh, your question is really a good uh, a great one, and that there's more information in the entire algebra that ought to be pulled out. Okay, uh, I still have a question. Uh, when you mm -hmm. use uh, uh, four tube relation um, to consider um, the, hom uh, uh, the uh, uh, homotopy, yeah. Uh, uh, then I think it is about the states, it's not about the enhanced states. So- in, in, Wait, what, what did you say? It's about uh, what, but not uh, what? It's about uh, the states, not the enhanced states. The cobordism. You, you when you use the cobordism and a four tube relationship, yeah, uh, to consider the uh, second read master move, yeah, I think uh, you. Can, um, you uh, well, yeah, I mean, I can go on and consider the first read master move and the third, but I was only concentrating on the second. We, that's another piece of homework I have to do for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I, I, right. I, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, actually, to to prove a uh, uh, covalent homology, uh, we need to show that uh, uh, covalent homology is invariant under the second read master move. Yeah, but uh, uh, but uh, in the cobordism and the four tube relationship, I only see uh, states the cobo the cobordism between states, not the inherent states. I mean, H one. Oh, no, wait, two. wait, wait! You mi you perhaps misunderstand me. Okay. I said 
that I'm going to look at the category and I'm going to think of the category as turned into the canopoly, which is essentially the chain complex by allowing okay. the direct sums along the constant Bs. Okay. And then the, co the chain e homotopy equivalence is the chain homotopy equivalence of the canopolies. And chain homotopy equivalence of canopolies is equivalent to chain homotopy equivalence of the chain complexes. Oh, oh, oh. You see, oh. so uh, it's levels of abstraction. We have the category, which is just the states and the arrows between them, but we, but we, um, we fold it up like an accordion. So we fold the category up like an accordion. So we're only looking at the canopoly. Okay. And it's still a category, however. It's just a category where there's just the zero, one, and the one, and the two, and the three, and the four, and a very complicated map from one to the next to the next, right? It, yeah. it, it really is a chain complex. Except the reason I say not a chain complex is because I can't take the kernel. I can't take the cycles. Uh, mm -hmm. At the categorical level, I have no definition of cycles. Right, but I do have a definition of chain homotopy equivalence. Okay. So that's very enlightening point, right? That I can do um, uh, I can do the the least amount of homological algebra that anybody could imagine, and yet it's just enough to get something that's invariant and gives me a high level description of uh, own way of thinking about what I'm trying to do. Oh, I think I roughly understand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, but but the whole thing is designed so that if you wanted to, if you wanted to take what I said and write it out in detailed algebra, you could. It's just a matter of adding more detail. Yeah. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay.